when you only have one singular planet with one singular atmosphere that is quite a number of light years from the next exoplanet that you know might have habitable conditions on it, the issue of whether or not we will have a sustainable atmosphere and climate has to be a unifying, fundamental, number one priority for the species as a whole right now. Because of all the other problems we have, no matter if we solved every problem from acne to, you know, uh, you name it, speeding, that would be totally useless without a sustainable system. And our system that now sustains basic life on the planet is in dire jeopardy. And if you doubt that, come to Seattle where ash was falling like the apocalypse last week, where our forests are raging, where islands are actually going underwater, where the glaciers are melting at unprecedented levels, our basic level of sustainable is very much at risk. And it's difficult for people in public life to talk in these apocalyptic terms, but it is the case. And I've been thinking about a new way of talking about climate disruption. I, I spent a lot of time in my life as governor declaring emergencies, declaring emergencies when the Wenatchee National Forest is burning down, declaring emergencies when a whole mudslide of mountain collapses during the biggest rainstorms we've had. I'm tired of declaring temporary one-off emergencies. We've got to look at this as a planetary emergency. And there is no other way to think about it that is, that is adequate to the task at hand. So that's when I would say, okay, you can put it all out there, but then hold on, who at this AI, is this going to be held by certain companies or certain countries? You know, we know there was a major nation state leader who said last week that the country that controls AI will control the world. So that was the Russian leader. It's as easy as looking at it and swiping up. We've handed over, like, you know, think about how much Google and Apple know about you. It's more than any government has known about you in the past. Unless so, they give it to the government. Exactly. I mean, sort of de facto, um, we've sort of handed over this authority to the platforms and we've placed this trust in them. And so um, I think for a majority of the population, that's just going to be the reality of everyday living. To be the pathway towards equity, towards progress, towards prosperity, exactly. basically, World 2.0. I'm a professor in environmental science. Right. I would even argue, let's stop talking about the environment. I mean, there's no such thing really as the environment. What we're talking about is human prosperity, human well being, and human equity of us as a world to survive and prosper on this planet Earth. People like to sort of withdraw from connecting it to climate change, going, this is not because of climate change, or you can't attribute climate change to any single weather event, which is true, technically, strictly speaking. But we know that the severity and intensity and frequency of these climate events have been rising over the last few years. The dangerous wildfire is exploding in California. It's closing in on homes. Wildfires lighting up the skies in Southern California. It was a tornado of embers going through here. I've never seen anything like this. This is the sound and the sight of firefighters losing ground in the suburbs of Los Angeles. Water! A major earthquake that has rocked central Mexico. And of course, this today's quake comes on the 32-year anniversary of a massive earthquake in Mexico. Tuesday's massive 7.1 earthquake, level 38 billion. Screams of, oh my God, echoing through Mexico City. Buildings crumbled and collapsed, sending dust clouds over the city. Earthquakes are being felt more often in Bali as locals and tourists brace for the Mount Agung volcano to erupt. After storming through the Caribbean, Hurricane Maria slammed Puerto Rico on Wednesday the 10th strongest Atlantic hurricane ever recorded. After Hurricane Maria ripped apart the island's entire power grid. Now families across the island trying to prepare for the humid darkness of life off the grid. Is it, is it possible to project uh, what will happen with these uh, weather events in the future? Will they continue to get more intense? So, I mean, I think the projections and the signs are showing that uh, you know, the, the intensity of these types of events will increase. 
Second, let me speak to the accelerating progress we're seeing in artificial intelligence. Over the last five or so years, we've seen amazing progress in automation, machine learning and AI. Whatever Estonians do as citizens these days, it's likely to involve their e-card. This is how Estonia works. Everybody has a card to access public services online. And here's something for the philosophical among you to ponder on. Estonia has basically embarked on an experiment that certainly smudges, perhaps even erases, the connections between state and country. If the state's functioning components can be sent down a fibre optic cable to work perfectly well from the other side of the world, well, will the states of the future need a fixed location at all? This way, the government also knows more about its citizens. To many in Europe, this idea of an all-knowing state is a big worry. Digital ID is part of a, every regular ID card in Estonia already for the last 16 years. You know, digital identity is automatically created at the birth. A doctor enters the details of a birth into the system and without the doctor herself recognizing this, in the background the system is creating digital identity for a baby. Parents later add the name, of course, without going to any office. And the digital citizen is born. Forget the cash or the plastic. Now your payment option is right at your fingertips. Literally, customers at the Cost Cutter supermarket at London's uh, Brunel University are the first in the world to pay for their groceries with finger vein scanners. But today, this shop became the first supermarket on the planet to use the new technology. Another step or finger to be precise, towards consigning cards and cash to history. Works by using a small infrared scanner to detect unique patterns in the veins in a person's fingertips. The information is then linked to a customer's bank details. So digital services can offer seamless coming into this world, seamless life in Europe for all our citizens if we take it in our hands to guarantee for them. But this is not the only thing which we need to do, of course. One thing is identity. One thing is digital services. So do you think it's more inspiring or alarming overall to have this kind of technology available to us? Overall, it's pretty alarming because nobody really realized how it is changing our world and nobody really realized the side effect it, it is going to have on our political regime, whether they are authoritarian regime or democracies. All those regimes are going to change deeply because of those technology. And this is a question nobody really asked the people who govern us. On these screens, you can see that every person in the room is filmed real-time. The grid you see here is analyzing my face. Our cameras can now recognize me, even from the side or when my head rotates 30 degrees to the left or right, or 15 degrees up or down. All employees at the company have given their face prints. Cameras film and record every move. Meanwhile, the technology continues to advance, and researchers are looking at even more complex and, and advanced algorithms for this sort of Yeah, thing. I mean, just a couple of examples over the last month. Cambridge University now say they're looking at a system, they've developed a system which could potentially identify people with scarves over their faces or wearing hats. So, I mean, you're looking at something potentially in the future when this technology really does start to take off, where you could walk past a camera and you're automatically added to a database. You wouldn't necessarily know about it and therefore you know, as your human rights may say, well, you can complain and get something done, you just wouldn't even know that it happened. You know, should we start thinking about this as AI as kind of a, a basic human right? You know, if you go over to the United Nations, you know, they have a wall with the basic human rights of things that they believe in. Is, is this so going to be so fundamental to our society that every country should have, every person, should, every company right. should have some kind of democratized access that AI is a basic human right. And that is a, you know, AI is not an SDG, you know, today, but should it be? Or should it be part of all the SDGs? It's hailed as progress, but also poses ethical questions. With the rapid development speed of artificial intelligence, 
and robotization, it is no longer a question of what machines can and cannot do. It is rather a question of what they should and should not do. Ethical issues related to the development of technology are clearly becoming greater relevance. They're coming out with a new model in 2018 that I guess is anatomically correct. Okay, but that's even creepier. Talking head, programmable personality. But see, that's even creepier. The closer they creep to being like a very, very uh, sort of realistic human being, the more that actually freaks us out. And let me tell you something, M. Chan, and I know you understand this. When artificial intelligence really kicks in, and we're talking this taking off exponentially, you're going to see these things. They're not even robots. You'll be seeing stories about it. You'll be seeing features about it, not just, but robots that aren't even robots, that are so human, so human-like, you will see a very scary psychological, psychiatric transformation in some cases. This is like nothing we've ever seen before.